This is a short video about what can you say about the continuity of um, continuous functions that have an inverse function. And so recall that an injective function is the same thing as saying one to one, but recall that injective functions have inverses. Also recall in the previous video, uh, I guess for me, maybe two videos ago, we talked about strictly monotone functions. So those are like strictly increasing or just strictly decreasing. Those functions are injective. So therefore by the above bullet point, strictly monotone functions have inverses. So if f is a strictly monotone function that's continuous on an interval i, where i might be a closed interval, it might be an open interval, maybe it's got a mix of parentheses and brackets, what we want to answer is what can we say about f inverse, the inverse function? And so here's the result. Let's say that you had a function f that's strictly increasing, so instead of monotone, let's pick one, so let's say it's increasing, and it's continuous then what the theorem is, is that then the inverse, f inverse, whose domain, right, is the range of f, is all this is trying to say, then the inverse is also strictly increasing and also continuous. So here's a picture of that. So like f's continuous and it's increasing, and you look, the inverse of that, which maybe you remember from like college algebra, the function in its inverse should be reflections of each other over that line y equals x, and so the inverse would be the blue function, it's increasing also. Um, and it's continuous also. Similarly, so instead of that word monotone, what happens if your function is strictly decreasing and continuous? Well, then again, the inverse is also strictly decreasing and continuous. And so there's a picture of those right there as well. So both of those are inverses of each other because they're supposed to be kind of mirror images of each other over that dotted red line, y equals x. And again, the green function is decreasing from left to right and the blue function is decreasing from left to right. And so that again is emphasizing this and uh, clearly it's continuous the way that I have them drawn. All right, so we'll just prove number one. So what do we get to assume? F is continuous and maybe remember that that means that the range should be an interval. So remember, continuous functions preserve intervals. So f of i has to be an interval also. And uh, also, since f strictly increasing, um, that means it's injective, so therefore it makes sense to talk about f inverse. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna show that f inverse is also strictly increasing. So again, we're assuming that f is strictly increasing. The first thing we're gonna do is show that f inverse is strictly increasing on its domain, which is again, the range of f. So how would we do that? So the way that we're going to do it is, okay, let's let y1 and y2 be two points that are in the domain of f inverse. And so what does that mean though? So if these things are in the domain of f inverse, that means that there exists x1 and x2 in the domain of f, such that y1 and y2 are the outputs of x1 and x2. And uh, what else we're we going to assume? We're going to assume that these two points, y1 and y2, we pick those in a way so that y1 is less than y2. Now what I'm going for, I want to show that f inverse is strictly increasing. My punchline for this part is that I want f, of, f inverse of y1 to be less than f inverse of y2. So that's what we're going for. So then I claim that it happens. So how are we going to show that this has to happen? So because otherwise, so again, maybe a miniature, let's entertain the thought that it was not true. Let's entertain the thought that f inverse of f y1 is bigger than or equal to f inverse of y2. Well, then in that case, remember, um, this is x1 and this is x2. So that's this inequality here. And remember that f's increasing, so that implies that f of x1 should be bigger than or equal to f of x2. But why is that bad? That's equivalent, f of x1 is y1 and f of x2 is y2. So y1 is bigger than or equal to y2, which is ridiculous because we suppose that y1 is strictly less than y2. So that's why, because otherwise, that can't happen. So it must be the case that f inverse of y1 is less than f inverse of y2. So what do we have then? f inverse is strictly increasing on its domain, right? We just showed if you took two points in the domain of f inverse, such that y1 is to the left of y2, then we just argued why f inverse of y1 has to be lower than f inverse of y2. So as you move from left to right, f inverse gets taller. Okay, so the last thing we wanna do is try to show that our function f inverse is continuous, and we'll try to use again the fact that f is continuous to do that. I'm highlighting the wrong one, I'm doing the increasing one, but again, I'm just focusing on the continuous part. So what if f inverse was discontinuous at some particular value c that's in my interval here? Or I guess really, sorry, that should not, should that be a c there in that case? Let's see, I think that's, 
that should probably have been a, instead of a C, C, not an I, sorry about that, an F of I. There, fixed it. All right, so remember to say that something's discontinuous at a point right there. Um, remember that's the same thing, saying that the jump of that function at C is positive, right? So continuous means the jump's equal to zero. So if it's discontinuous, that means the jump has to be positive. And I know it's positive because my function is increasing. So further, what can I say? So if that jump is positive, remember the jump at a point is uh, the difference in the left and the right-hand limits. I know that the right-hand limit should be bigger than the left-hand limit uh, of, my of my function f inverse. So what we're going to do is, okay, if the left-hand limit is less than the right-hand limit of my function f inverse at c, then let's pick any number that's just strictly between those two that's not actually equal to the value of f inverse of c. So let's let x be a number that's between both of these. So x is between each of these. And what else do I want to notice here? The left-hand limit should be a number that's in this interval i. And similarly, the right-hand limit should be a number that's in this interval i. Well, if this is the case though, x cannot be the output of f inverse for any point in the domain of f inverse, if that's the case. So if I've got a picture for you here, what I'm saying is I've got a jump. So the blue is the graph of f inverse and I've highlighted the domain of f inverse is down below. So if there is a jump there, which there is, I should be able to find some point between the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit there, x. And so x can't be the out point of anything in blue because otherwise there'd be a blue part of the graph right here. And there's not, there's nothing there. There's just this void here. So that's this part, I'm sorry. That's, that's this part right here. On the other hand though, like, wait a minute, like x is in this interval i. So like if these are two points in the interval here, then every point between them should be in the interval. So x has to be in that interval. So that's our contradiction here, right? This would say that x is not contained in that interval, but that's a contradiction because an interval should contain all the numbers between any two numbers that are in the interval. So uh, in that case, if f is discontinuous at any point in there, I could always come up with this contradiction. Therefore, this has to be false. And so what does that mean if that is false? That means that f has to be continuous, f inverse, sorry, has to be continuous at uh, every single point in its domain. And again, that should be f of i right there.